Hi, I'm Jeff Ranke, Editorial Director of Manufacturing.net and Manufacturing Business Technology. Welcome to Security Breach. Now, maybe you're sick of hearing about phishing schemes and the way hackers are using this strategy to infiltrate your networks or access intellectual data or even shut down production and hold your assets for ransom. Now, if that's the case, then you've made a lot of hackers very happy. And based on Proofpoint's 2024 State of Fish report, protecting against phishing schemes is simply not being reinforced or given the proper priority. For example, the report found that 71% of surveyed users admitted to taking a risky action and 96% knew they were doing something risky when interacting with email or text messages. 85% of security professionals said that most employees know they're responsible for security, but 59% of those employees weren't sure or claimed that they're not responsible for cybersecurity. Furthermore, 24% admitted to responding to emails or text messages from someone they did not know, and 19% clicked on links in emails from people they didn't know. Looking at the extortion element of these attacks, 69% of surveyed organizations were infected by ransomware and only 41% regained access to data after their first payment. Additionally, there was a 50% increase in reports of reputational damage due to phishing incidents. Finally, 73% of surveyed companies reported a business email compromise, but only 29% are actively teaching users about these BEC attacks. Here to help sort out these troubling findings and assess the phishing threat landscape is Craig Taylor. He's co-founder of Cyberhood, a leading provider of phishing prevention solutions. Craig, thanks so much for joining us today and welcome to Security Breach. So, you know, in the intro, I went through a bunch of stats talking about how phishing is still this huge concern. We've been knowing about it for a long time, but people are just not taking the right actions. Maybe you could give us a little bit of sort of a, an overview of the landscape a little bit in terms of maybe what are some of the new tactics the hackers are using and why are we just not responding or getting ready to or preparing ourselves to handle these types of attacks? Well, that's an interesting question, and it's one that I think a lot about, Jeff, because it's not rocket science. Phishing yeah. attack is a flavor of social engineering. Uh, hackers know that they can get people to click. If they can get people to click, they can do things like uh, install malware, steal uh, credentials, or even session tokens. You asked about what's changing and new in phishing attacks, and it's this post-authentication theft of your session token. So when you log into a bank or your email system, you get delivered a token. Usually it's encrypted between you and them, but it lives in your computer. And sometimes when you click on a malicious link, it can reach in and steal that session token. So the reality is phishing is, is today and has been for the last 20 plus years, the number one way hackers breach companies and individuals. Uh, it hasn't changed. What has happened, what has changed is the frequency, the impact, and the damage that's done when you fall victim to a phishing attack. As I started to say, it's not rocket science. It's pretty straightforward stuff. But I'll tell you this, you can graduate from MIT or any Ivy League school or high school or any school educational institution in the country with zero cyber literacy training today. You can have computer literacy. That's completely different. But cyber literacy, how to operate a, an email account, a, ca a calendar, a computer safely and securely, it's lost on our educational system. And so, you know, companies and individuals need to step up and learn these skills because it's the cost of doing business today is so enormous when you make a mistake in the space. Yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about email compromise because in the industrial sector, that seems to be this massive inroad that the hackers are using. Going back mm -hmm. to Colonial Pipeline, I mean, that's how they they basically stole credentials and and got into the network that way to shut things down. What are we missing here? <laughs> you know, it, like you you started saying, it's not rocket science, but we're not getting the point across to users to be careful in terms of what they open, what they click on where they log into, all of these things. In your experience, Craig, how do we get through there or what are we not doing right? This may end up sounding like a commercial for my company, but and I'm gonna try not to make it that. What I, what I would say is that the tools that are on the market to teach people not to click have the wrong focus 
Jeff, to be plain and simple. Um, let me take a step back before we answer that question. 30 years ago, I had a degree in psychology where I studied operant conditioning, right? In the classic sense, it's teaching a rat to press a button to get food. That is a positive reinforcement schedule, meaning when you give the treat, the food, the rat's gonna do whatever behavior led to that. In, in, in fish training sites all over the internet, all the different competitors that we face and all of the, the marketplace follows not a positive reinforcement schedule for fishing, testing, and training. In, our, in other words, these mm -hmm. are the tools that companies deploy to teach their users not to click, but they teach that skill in a negative reinforcement schedule. What does that mean? Well, negative reinforcement means when you make a mistake, you get punished. Uh, think of a shot collar on a dog around a perimeter of a property where if the dog gets too close to the edge of the property, they get zapped. That's negative reinforcement. It tamps down bad behaviors, right? And that's what most of the industry thinks they need to do. Let's stop people from clicking. Stop the click, right? That's negative reinforcement training. And all it does is makes people fearful, anxious, and afraid of their inbox. And what they end up doing in many cases, I've talked to dozens of people, if not hundreds, who said, I give up. I don't know what's safe and not safe to click on, so I just forward everything to IT. And that is the story I hear from MSP after MSP, from IT department to IT department. And it teaches me a valuable lesson around what makes CyberHoo different. That negative reinforcement would be okay if you started with what is okay to do, what is the good behaviors you want to reward and encourage, right? Inspecting the sender for a typo squatted domain name. That is really hyper realistic to what hackers do. Um, looking at the subject and the urgency and emotionality of an email that is designed to get people to react because psychologists and hackers and social uh, security researchers all know humans make more mistakes when they react to things, right? It's just human nature. It's yeah. personal. You know, you're driving down the road, somebody cuts you off. The first reaction is usually a mistake, right? Um, so the idea here is you have to use positive reinforcement training to teach people the skills they need to absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, know when they're under attack. And if they know how to inspect the six or seven pieces of the phishing puzzle in an email, the sender, the subject, the greeting, spelling, punctuation, and grammar, urgency, emotionality, links to external website attachments. If they, if everyone learned what six or seven pieces of that puzzle are, put them all together, they have a crystal clear picture with which to identify phishing in their inbox, and they'd stop forwarding all these messages to IT. They wouldn't have to be punished for failing when they click on that fake message that gets sent to them. And the world would be a better place. And the proof is the entire industry is getting better and better at the negative reinforcement training with more realistic examples and you know better injection into the mailboxes of systems and people and you know not falling victim to what I call the Goldilocks principle of phishing. Have, have you ever heard that term? I've heard some different variations. Why don't you uh, offer it's us yours? A, it's yeah. as simple as this. When an IT department or an MSP sends fake emails to the inboxes of users, there's a Goldilocks problem they face. It can be too easy and easily identifiable to insult the intelligence of your end users. They look at their IT department going, how stupid do you think I am? This is so <laughs> obviously fish and you're just yeah. testing me as to delete it. But they're somewhat insulted. It's probably the least of all the problems with fish testing. On the other hand, you have it too hard. That's the real danger in fish testing because I've had, you can look on Reddit and I've seen people comment, I was promised a raise by my boss and then I got a raise email that I clicked on and it was a fake phishing test. And oh my God, I am quitting today. That's the last straw. And other ones have been promised bonuses at Christmas time or, you know, any kind of what a person thinks they deserve email. And then it, not only isn't that, it's a test, they fail it and they're punished with 35 minutes of video training. It's a very negative experience for most people. It erodes goodwill and customer retention if you're an MSP. Uh, essentially, that's way too hard for people and it's not fair, it's too devious. 
and it doesn't really teach any good skills because it the the learning is lost in the anger and frustration yeah. so getting it just right means you have to pick the right technology stack that everybody uses in the company and, and it can't be too hard it can't be too easy it's really difficult to do well uh, but it's all fundamentally based on negative reinforcement training to stop the clicks without teaching what's okay to click or what is what is considered a valid email and when should i actually pick up the phone and call somebody because it's just off something's not right about this i check out all the parts of the email but it still doesn't seem right so my intuition is call the person to figure out did they really send me that invoice that i don't get invoices at my company for so why would i get this yeah it's interesting. I want, I want to circle back to the messaging because as and I think we've talked about before, actually talking about the different tools that are out there that are now playing a role in the messaging, both on the offensive and defensive side of things there. But one of the things that we talk a lot about on security breach is the human element of cybersecurity and the bigger mm -hmm. role that's playing now. In a lot of things that you just mentioned there, there is much about culture as they are about the actual implementation of the process. When you're working with companies or maybe even going back to your psychology training, mm -hmm. how do we sort of break that down? Because it's very easy to say, hey, we, we want to embrace this. We want to have the right messaging. We want to have the right approach to cybersecurity so employees get more involved. But it's so easy to lean back on sort of that punitive approach as opposed to a more complementary one. Right. Have you seen any strategies or approaches that can help us, again, sort of find that just right um, type of approach? Yeah, you have to start with communication all the way through from the top leadership all the way down and everyone needs to participate. Um, it's helpful to share close calls with employees. It's helpful to share industry metrics that, for example, it's Awareness Month. And at my company, CyberHoot, we put out 31 days of cybersecurity statistics that you can download off our website and brand and send to your employees. And one of the stories it tells is that last year, the third largest economy of the world, after the US at 27 trillion and China at 17 trillion and change, was cybercrime. Number wow. three, at 10, $9.5 trillion of criminal behavior and uh, funds changing hands to the wrong people. That should be incredibly sobering. So when you want to talk about establishing a culture in your company, you need to talk about here's what we do and the data we have and why someone might be after it. They might be after it to embarrass us as a company, even if you have not a lot of really highly sensitive data. They might be after extorting money from us, right? Uh, organized crime and, and so on have try to uh, move online where there's fewer video cameras on cell phones to take pictures of physical crimes um, and so on. And if you can have this communication with your staff that everybody has a role to play here, that we're only as strong as our weakest link and we need every single person from the CEO down to uh, the, the, the mailroom clerk completing these assignments for educating users on spotting and avoiding phishing attacks, on the importance of password hygiene and some of the other more prominent attacks, uh, we, you would do well to start to mold that culture into cyber awareness. And there's another underlying theme that I think is quite valuable if you're listening to this and you're running your cyber program at your company, this benefits people personally as much as professionally. So don't teach it as you need to protect our company. No, you need to protect yourself and your family. And in doing so, in learning these cyber literacy skills, you're going to benefit yourself, your career, your family, and the, the business you work in so that we all have a job. Because guess what? Sometimes these breaches are so big, painful, and, uh, and damaging Companies have a hard time recovering, not in all cases. And it's certainly there's some statistics out there that are thrown about that if you dig into them aren't true. Like the one that I have seen dozens of times is 60 percent of businesses go out of business after six months of a breach. That's not corroborated in any statistic. You can unravel that thread through the Internet and you never get to someone that did an empirical <laughs> study. It does not exist. So. Be careful what you look for. That's why it's not in our 31 days. We don't put that out there. 
No, well said, Craig. And, and, you know, made me think a little bit too there. Part of the social engineering process or the social engineering process, I should say, is getting all those bits and pieces. That's not just personal data. It's also professional and sorting, putting all that together so they can craft whatever messaging they need to to whomever to make it look or sound like you or or to extract whatever data they're looking for. So that's a, it's a great point in terms of how this impacts the individual, not just the company from that perspective. Right. Yep. And I want to circle back to, you know, looking at the messaging that's being used. One of the biggest buzz terms throughout all walks of life, not just manufacturing, not just cybersecurity, is artificial intelligence. And oh, with yeah. a lot of these large language models becoming more prominent and easy to access, the hackers are using it. We know that they're using it to craft these phishing messages, but I've always felt there's also an application for us on the defensive side to also use AI. I'd kind of like to get your thoughts there in terms of how both sides could be using this technology to make their, uh, or how both sides are using this, the technology. Well, it's no, di I'm old enough to remember the arms race in the 80s and, and between you know Cold War Russia and the United States and everybody had to build more nuclear weapons and facilities and bunkers and this and that. It, AI is really just another arms race in the hacker and defensive um, uh, arena. It's yeah. the same attacks, right? Just made better. And the same defenses just made better. Let me put it to you clearly. Uh, one of the common technologies that people have and put in place at companies is a SIM, security incident event monitoring. It ingests logs from all the different tools that you have from firewalls and authentication and you know different applications. And it, then it teases out the needles in the haystack. Well, humans doing that and, and script, scripts that do that are only so good. But large language models and AI can really zone in on those minute critical differences between everything up until this point said X, Y, Z. Now we have X, Y, Z, but the Z is a you know, superscript. There's something a little yeah. off by Z. What's going on? And so it teases out these things and then humans can take it from there. Uh, so it's making our intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems that much better. It's also allowing the tool developers, the antivirus, the anti-malware, the firewall vendors of the world to write code more quickly, to write it perhaps better, although that, that jury is out. Uh, but it can do some of the minutia that has usually been done by humans in the past. That's on the offensive side. It can develop better technologies to uh, analyze large data for those anomalies. On the hacker side, you've all heard of ChatGPT, but did you know there's a fraud GPT and a worm GPT? These are large language models that are designed to help hackers hack. And in our tool at CyberWho, we ask people to watch out for spelling, punctuation, and grammar mistakes. And I can tell you now that any hacker that sends out mistakes of spelling, punctuation, and grammar is just lazy, doesn't have, <laughs> isn't, isn't doing the yeah. right things, right? AI can change that language. And here's the scary part, right? We have adversaries that are in different countries of the world, and they can now translate anything they want from any language to any language. So if you're yeah. in the United States and you wanted to write something in Swahili, you could have a gram grammatically correct phishing attack in in whatever language you want and vice versa. So the world has become flat, you know, to quote that old book, it's more flat today than ever before, particularly because the language barrier has been eliminated by AI. And that puts us all at risk for, you know, attacks from anyone, anywhere, any place, anytime. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's crazy. You know, one of the things you brought up there was tools and, there's just been this influx of tools, especially when we look at phishing, because to your point, it's not always rocket science. We can use higher levels of technology to help defend against it, but at its premise, it's not real complicated. What are you seeing out there in terms of this influx of tools and maybe helping the audience understand those that are, yeah, they might do a little bit, but they're not worth the investment versus those that might be worth a higher level of, uh, of, of financial investment? I have a thought that I, I'm reticent to share because we wanted to develop it at CyberWho, but it, it also is probably would never be adopted by users out there. And it's this, 
um, listened to a podcast not too long ago about the lack of friction in social media is the cause of some of the social downfalls we're seeing in young people today, children and, and our kids and other areas. And uh, just quickly extrapolate it. So because you can comment on anything, anywhere, anytime in social media, and you really don't see the reactions of people, people are saying things they shouldn't and that they might otherwise regret if you saw the pain on somebody's face. So taking all of that and saying, there's no friction involved in making those comments. Well, yeah. what if we added that concept? And the argument for that is to add friction to social media, but nobody wants that because who wants to slow down things? Yeah. But imagine we added friction to email, okay? What if you had yeah. a button living in your email client, Outlook, and, it's, and it, all it did was look for email criteria, maybe AI driven that said, hey, you've never talked to this person before, click through this ex this button that says, I know I have never talked to this person before, even though it's the president of my company. Well, it's from outside and it's not from your it's not from your own yeah. domain. So, oh, my God. But yeah. that little bit of friction in various scenarios of email phishing attacks would be amazingly effective. Hmm. But the feedback I've received from multiple people is like, no one wants to have to click through to answer email. We all have 2 million email messages a day. Who wants to add 10 minutes to our day of, yes, I know this person. No, I don't know this person, but I was expecting this, whatever the case may be. That friction would be an enormously beneficial tool to add to our day-to-day uh, -day if someone, instead of having a report spam button, have a interrogate the email and tell me when there's a <laughs> risk here. Button. I like that the interrogate button. That's 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 good, and I, mm -hmm. I would assume a lot of network administrators are going. Well, that's why I have a sandbox. That's why I have some of this other filtering in place. But to your point, it's just a pause. It's not a stop, and I think that could be extremely effective. It's a it's an interesting concept. Absolutely, that's one. The one that I don't like um, at all, Jeff, is this one obfuscation of the URL. Let's rewrite the URLs, every single URL that comes into my email yeah. so that it goes through my sandbox. But don't let the person look at what it is. So we got to keep them kind of ostriches with their head in the sand, not teaching them how yeah. to inspect a typo squatted domain name, right? In our examples, let me just go down this rat road for a while. When you send fake messages to the inbox of, a, of an end user with that negative reinforcement path, there's a critical flaw in it that actually has been studied by the University of Switzerland, uh, 14,000 users over 15 months, and their conclusion was this. People that are traditionally fake message tested with email, the way the whole industry has worked for 20 years, have a propensity to click more, not less, on phishing mm. emails. Oh my goodness, it's a $7 billion industry. No before, you know, was bought for $6.5 billion by venture capital. And you go look into it a little further and you start to realize, well, if we wanted to send you, Jeff, a phishing email to see if you would click, let's say it was from Netflix. And we said, the domain name we can use to send that email to you cannot have any remote resemblance to the domain netflix.com. Because if it did, you might report it as spam or phishing it would go to the authorities who manage all the yeah. spam reports. Then it would go to Netflix. And then Netflix lawyers would reach out to us and say, cease and desist or we'll sue you. You cannot impersonate us. So what we, and that's happened to us three times. We have had <laughs> cease letters from Facebook, from the IRS and Zoom. No, and we're on Zoom. So no wow. offense to Zoom. They're just doing to protect their brand. This is yeah. what they think they need to do. But what it means is we have to use very dumbed down domain names like ch-accounts.com, right? What would yeah. that be? Cyberhoot-account-mfa or dash reset or whatever dot com. And so end users think they're pretty smart when they look at that fake email and go, oh, this isn't Netflix, it's ch-accounts. That's the level of testing. That's the level of hacker I'm up against. When in fact, with our simulated phishing that we've turned into a positive reinforcement training, to encourage good behaviors at Cyberhoot, we've asked users to label those six or seven parts I alluded to earlier in an email and label them safe or suspicious. And when we send a Netflix example, we have a domain name with an I missing in Netflix. And I was, I was doing a demo the other day with a woman. She goes, yeah, that's safe. I said, are you sure? Yeah, I, let me zoom in. I zoomed in. 
yeah, it's safe. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Because her experience in this, or his, I, I don't want to single anybody out, was it's got to be obviously wrong. And she had no clue or he had no clue of typo squatted domain names. When I really zoned in on it, she was like, oh, my God, there's an I. I want your product now. I want everybody to know this because this is what yeah. hackers do, right? Yep. That is the truth. They will have a domain registered for a period of a week or two. And it'll be taken down by the authorities when yep. it's been reported. But by then, so many people have already fallen victim to that attack because we're dumbing people down with that negative reinforcement that doesn't teach you the skills you need to really understand fishing. So I like to say our, our motto is somewhat like, we teach you how to fish, feeding you for a lifetime of processing email in your inbox through these exercises of identifying safe or unsafe on those seven components of an email. Because that's the fundamental challenge that we face is not abdicating responsibility, forwarding everything to IT. Don't click, don't click, never click. Well, no, you actually have to click on certain emails for certain reasons. And if you can know when and why and how, then you have a higher degree of confidence. Now, business email compromise is the one real big boomerang curveball for everybody, obviously, when yeah. the vendor that you're dealing with on a day by day basis gets compromised and sends you that invoice, then you have to start applying other common sense metrics like I'm in sales or I'm in marketing. Why am I getting an invoice that goes to finance? Right. Then you need to pick up the phone and say, I think your account might have been hacked or compromised. Yeah. You should probably look into it. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, that whole process, again, getting away from the punitive approach to educating the the user as well as providing that level of defense, it, it, it makes a ton of sense. You know, mm -hmm. one thing I'd like to throw at you too, Craig, I feel like we are getting better. In the industrial sector, we are learning. We, we've seen some of the things that are going on, but the volume of attacks is so much higher and it just continues to escalate as you mentioned I and mean, just with the growing the economy as it is of the, uh, the the phishing scheme what are we learning what are we getting better at what what growth areas or improvements have you seen that maybe we can build on and use those as sort of a basis for some training programs or or helping employees embrace the fact that they are a part of this process Jeff, I'm glad you brought up the improvement idea because we have seen improvement. And just last week, NIST published their codified recommendations for password hygiene, right? We know that for the last 25 years, NIST had published bad advice for password hygiene, change it every 90 days, require complexity in the passwords. And, and those are both bad ideas. I mean, in theory, they could be good, but in practice, they're never good. It makes people cheat. And that's what they acknowledged. They said, listen, don't force password changes because we want to force long passwords that people will memorize as a passphrase and maybe put into a password manager that can be 14 characters long. long length is strength in password hygiene. Tie it to multi-factor, adopt a password manager. All of those things are best practices today. And I see a lot of improvements in companies providing the password manager and following those guidance, that guidance that is just literally last week. Since 2017, we've been preaching those methodologies to our clients at Cyberhoot. And it really does make a difference. And so manufacturing has long ago adopted a lot of those things. Uh, they're training their employees now better than ever before. It's no longer, you know, I've been around a long time. In my <laughs> earliest of careers, I worked at a firewall vendor back in the 1995, 96. And the arguments we made then were, hey, you're connecting to this great big world thing called the Internet. And you need to protect your business from that with a firewall. Uh, and uh, around that same time, people need antivirus, right? There were these arguments people push back on. I don't need it. It's a safe world and we don't have to worry about it. Well, companies have come a long way. And I think in manufacturing, there's a recognition that we have to train all of our knowledge workers. We need to, you know, do this thing called fish testing, but we're, we're not happy with it. And I, I would argue, Jeff, that the number of breaches we see in the world is directly related to this flawed negative reinforcement methodology that doesn't teach knowledge and education around phishing emails, but it teaches punishment and stop clicking, like turn right. the clicks down. It suppresses bad behaviors, no different than that shock collar on a dog. You, know, you can train a dog at a, at a dog park with a shock collar and they're not happy, you're not happy. 
But if you were to give treat based training, there's and you know, not all dogs are food motivated, I'll, <laughs> I'll admit, but the majority are and they love that. I have a dog, I train him with treats and he loves going to the park to learn new skills. That's a win win for everybody. And the positive reinforcement teaching of fishing indicators is a positive reinforcement for the employee, for the company, for the MSP or the IT department. Absolutely. You know, Craig, we've covered a, t a lot of ground here looking at the, the different types of fishing tactics. We've talked about AI. Are there any other trends that you're really seeing out there that could have long or short term impacts going forward? Other trends. Um, in terms of, did you think of any specific area that you might be interested in? For example, I mean, we can go into esoteric topics like quantum computing is going to break our encryption routines, which the internet <laughs> runs on, right? right? The internet runs on encryption. There's no way that the internet could function with banking and all this if we didn't have HTTPS encrypting between the website and our, and our browser. Well, quantum computing breaks the encryption algorithms because it can do so many attempts to find the key that it doesn't break. But the good news there is that they've had a, an eight or nine year mathematical competition to replace it with something that's called quantum resistant uh, encryption that can resist the quantum computing that's out there. So there's a big trend there. Um, I think the biggest trend that I would say is happening is that our development of new technologies, AI is a great example, the adoption of AI was so much faster by so many more people like the majority of the world have touched AI by within 12 to 18 months of it. And the internet wasn't touched by the majority of the world for probably five years, 10 years, maybe even. So the adoption of these new technologies is so much quicker today. Things are developing and rolling out yeah. much faster that there are two or three problems with it. One, the social norms of how to use it don't exist yet, right? How do you do it safely and securely? How do you do it you know, kindly and gently with your families? All of those things kind of catch up afterwards. And we're seeing it now with social media and cell phones in, in the hands of children. It can be a very damaging thing. Uh, we're only now, there's legislation to, to get age limits on different things and hour limits on th certain things for our young people. So the trend is things are happening faster. They're happening more um, in more challenging ways and it's hard to adapt. You know, heck, I'm, I'm getting old enough where it is difficult for me to adapt, an old dog and new <laughs> tricks. Thanks, Craig. And for more information on the work he and his colleagues are up to, you can check him out at cyberhoot.com. Also, like to thank you for joining us today. And to catch up on past episodes, you can go to manufacturing.net, ien.com, or mbtmag.com. You can also check Security Breach out wherever you get your podcasts, including Apple, Amazon, and Overcast. And if you have a cybersecurity story or topic that you'd like to have us explore on Security Breach, you can reach me at jeff at ien.com. For Craig Taylor, I'm Jeff Ranke, and this is Security Breach.